Uh, the WHO is officially launching a voluntary patent pool tomorrow to collect patent rights, regulatory test data and other information that could be shared to develop drugs, vaccines and diagnostics. Is this something that uh, your company supports, uh, Pascal? Well, and I have to say I was not aware of this initiative and we would have to consider it, but um, I think IP is a fundamental uh, part of, uh, of our industry. And if you don't uh, protect IP, then essentially there is no incentive for anybody to innovate. Now, what is important is that companies volunteer to uh, provide their products at no profit like we are doing right now in case of pandemic or crisis and when it's needed. But I don't, I don't know that uh, necessarily challenging IP or taking IP away is the solution to these issues. The solution to these issues is really to have a robust pharmaceutical industry that step up to help when needed and do it at uh, no profit. Um, Thomas. Yeah, happy to take that question, so to speak, on behalf of the industry, because uh, as Pascal and others have indicated, I think one of the reasons we have been able to respond at such a speed in such a collaborative way is that we are starting from a flourishing innovation ecosystem, which is based on, on strong IP. Having said that, we are now confronted to a business as unusual, which means what I've also seen from many companies is a willingness to embrace, for example, voluntary licensing, scaling up, seeking partnerships. And we believe that uh, we do have the mechanisms, we do have the platforms, for example, the medicines patent pool, which has played a, a very important role in HIV, AIDS and, uh, and malaria, for example, has expanded its scope for the period of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we've seen companies, for example, with therapeutics signing uh, big uh, you know agreements with the MPP for voluntary licensing so that you can scale up I'm not quite sure to be honest that uh, we do need additional platforms because we already have platforms the industry is already doing all the right things and also to some extent I feel that the focus on IP, for example, in vaccines shows a lack of understanding because in vaccines, it's all about know-how. It is about the experience. It is about the ability of scaling up. And in the history, for example, of IP, there's never been a compulsory licensing for vaccine, not for nothing. It really doesn't solve the problem. The industry is doing all the right things, which it is asked for. Emma, you're nodding your head. Would you like to come in and then Albert? Yes. So a couple of points really to, to endorse what Pascal said and Thomas. First of all, I think we, we it would be right to say that IP is absolutely fundamental to our industry. And if our industry is mobilizing now, it's because of the investments in science and research that's been uh, uh, made uh, you know, with, with, with that support. But also, there's not... Whether it be in HIV, which we participate in heavily, or in vaccines, uh, there's not enormous uh, evidence that IP is a barrier to access. Um, because, you know, I think it's for six years now you've been getting this uh, licensing model arrangements in HIV to drive enormous uh, uh, access um, in the developing countries that really do face this challenge at, at, at the most material scale. And you just look at the functioning of Gabby with tiered pricing in, in, in vaccines to see how frankly, um, you know, beyond clean water vaccines has been able to have the biggest health uh, impact on developing countries possible, whilst protecting uh, uh, the IP principles that allow us to invest in the advances of science. Albert, you wanted to come in on the IP question. Yes, yeah. I want to say that uh, I'm very respectful of the opinions of many people, of everyone. And uh, as such, I think I'm hearing all the people that are speaking about IP. But I have to say that at this point of time, uh, it's, I think, is nonsense, and at this point of time, it's also dangerous. Right now, I spoke about. Uh, you asked me the first question was about the five points plan that we issued, that we are here to help. I have in front of me the uh, yesterday's list. 487 biotechs or other companies reached out to Pfizer within six weeks to request help. There is a giant effort right now happening to find a solution. To this pandemic and the risks that we are taking is billions of dollars and the
chances that we are getting are still not very good, right? So it's not that we have a vaccine in our pocket, right? Now we are working to make a vaccine. At this stage that people are investing their billions, hundreds of biotechs, to find a solution, to have a discussion, keep in mind that if you discover it, we are going to take your IP, I think is dangerous. GSK is the largest uh, pharmaceutical company in the world which makes vaccines and is not making a COVID-19 vaccine. I understand that GSK is making an adjuvant that several candidates are using, but was GSK's decision not to make a candidate COVID-19 vaccine in any way linked to the company's losses from PH1N1 and Ebola vaccine projects? Emma. No, and let me let me, let me start. To, the short answer is no, but I should start by correcting. We're not the largest uh, pharmaceutical company. We are uh, the uh, uh, largest vaccines uh, manufacturer, but one of uh, uh, of many. And I really want to be clear on this. You know, right at the beginning in January, it was obvious, as we've all said, this is going to be a an enormous global problem with, you know, um, I, I'm just impact we've never seen before, including indirect impact, because we all know the indirect impact on health that the economic impact is going to have beyond the direct impact of, uh, of COVID. And the question was, what could we uniquely bring with our know-how that others might not be able to? And that, you know, we're now at over 200 candidate vaccines. We're talking about some of the lead and most visible ones that come from big companies today. Um, but there are many candidate vaccines. Should BSK add to that list? Or could we increase the probability of success of multiple candidates by offering our adjuvant broadly to any credible candidate that comes forward, knowing that that's already worked in a pandemic? We've got new technologies that are coming through that people are working on, we've heard about today, but some of those have never been licensed before. Others not at scale for a long time. There are others that are proven, but might take a bit longer to get to. Um, but but our, that we felt what only we could bring was this adjuvant technology that was a boost to multiple other candidates and to be able to do that at scale. And, and, uh, and that's, we think, the best contribution we can bring now. That doesn't mean we're not looking at uh, you know, other technologies. And frankly, um, you know, uh, pan-COVID uh, um, uh, opportunities further down the line. But in turning, fi fixing this immediate challenge, we thought that was the right way forward, very much in a, in a principle of collaboration. Okay. Uh, Financial Times, let me ask Thomas, because there's a direct question here, uh, Thomas, uh, for you, which was um, they want to know more about IP plans on therapeutics and vaccines and plans to license those technologies to expand access. What sort of further commitments can you make on the record, given criticism that some of those claims are vague? And what do you make of the Costa Rican WHO IP pool proposal due to be launched tomorrow? I know that you've already said some words on that. Uh, there's a specific question, Thomas, if you want to add, will you be there and will you be speaking publicly? I think in terms of general attitude on IP, IP is an enabler. We wouldn't be where we are without strong IP. And companies are doing all the things one would hope them to do. You know, partnership, responsive, socially responsive, willing to scale up at risk and everything else you would want them to do. Also embracing the existing mechanisms on voluntary licensing, I don't quite see what the new initiative adds. Will you be there at this uh, new initiative that's launched tomorrow, the FT is asking? I'm too busy. <laughs>